2007, I had the opportunity to spend the summer up in Grand Forks, North Dakota, as a chaplain at All True Hospital. I wasn't ordained yet a deacon or a priest, but it was just a summer assignment to go and learn how to do kind of pastoral care. It was a beautiful experience being in the hospital. It's also the first time I've ever spent a summer in a rectory. It's a rectory, it's where, well, priests live. And it was at the rectory of St. Michael's Catholic Church, right there in historic Grand Forks, North Dakota. I was able to get to know the parishioners a little bit over the, the two months I was there. I think because they're North Dakotans, about seven weeks in, they finally said hello to me. That was very uh, nice as I was there every single day. Maybe we can continue to work on that here in Minnesota uh, as, as well. But all honesty is I got to know the parishioners and I got to know some of the patients in the hospital. I realized that someone told me it was going to happen is that everything in Grand Forks, especially in 2007, was referenced by pre-flood and post-flood. As you may remember, Grand Forks was struck with a, a once-in-a-lifetime flood in 1997, and it destroyed much of downtown, especially historic Grand Forks. And this included, by the way, uh, the parish of St. Michael. And they shared a story with me about the parish that really just it struck me with this great awe and, and, and wonder. You see, as you may remember those, those floods, uh, they, were, they were so big uh, that they, they decide that they didn't decide the flood can't decide anything, right? But the flood was, was so massive. But even then, they thought, especially in Grand Forks, who have experienced flooding before, that it wasn't going to go over the dikes. They thought they had enough protection from the flood walls and everything like this but it was always done by sandbags. As a matter of fact, uh, I remember the year of 1997, I remember watching the news with my brothers, and they said, we were looking for volunteers to help move sandbags from uh, the flooding that's happened in the Mississippi River and kind of Bayport area up to Grand Forks. We need an assembly line to move those sandbags off the dike down here to go up to Grand Forks. I remember with my brothers, we looked at each other and said, we're pretty big guys we can move sandbags. And so we went down there in the pouring rain, trying to move sandbags to get up to Grand Forks in time to try to make the dike even bigger and even stronger. The sandbags never made it in time, by the way. It was a Friday when all of a sudden they realized that the dike may or may not hold up. They thought there might be a couple leaks, and so they thought, let's go ahead and move people in the low areas to higher ground. As a matter of fact, the, the prison in Grand Forks, hopefully you don't know where that is, by the way, uh, but the prison in Grand Forks is pretty much right, was right next to uh, the river. And so they called up the pastor at St. Michael's, and they asked him, can we move the prisoners into the gym? Because we don't think the floods can come anywhere near St. Michael's. The pastor, of course, agreed, bring them on over. We have a place for them so that they can be safe. So sure enough, prisoners were showing up into the school gym, some still with shackles around their ankles. During that time as well, there was holy hours going on for flood protection for the town and for the church. But at 10 p.m. that night, that, that Friday night, the dike started to break. By 10.30 p.m., it was pretty much going full out. By 11.30 p.m., there was mass chaos happening and Grand Forks. The local radio stations, the newscasters, actually asked the priest of St. Michael's to spread words of encouragement, saying it's going to be okay. But the dikes, with a complete fail, no one expected the floodwaters to come close to St. Michael's. But by 3 a.m. now, the water was starting to flood into the gym, into the youth center, where the prisoners were staying. So at 3 a.m., that it moved the prisoners again. At 7.15 in the morning, because it's the Church of St. Michael's, it's a very traditional, beautiful church, they still had daily mass at 7.15 in the morning. They had a whopping three parishioners there, all with their kind of high hip boots on, so they could trek through the waters to get there. It reminds me, by the way, sometimes when there's blizzards here in Minnesota, and I think no one's going to be here, and all of a sudden there's 25 people here for a daily mass. Not even Sunday. I'm like, what are we doing here? 
Praise God you made it. It's much easier for me to come. I live four houses away. But it's a great devotion people have towards the Eucharist. So even in the midst of floods, people were coming. But by 9 a.m. that morning, the floodwaters had started rushing into the basement of St. Michael. And it was coming at an alarming rate. At this point, there was a mandatory evacuation. Everyone had to get out of the area. And so they all took off. I can only imagine the next day, the first time probably in St. Michael's history, that they did not have a Sunday Mass inside the church. Maybe you remember those images. I know I still remember those images from the flood of Grand Forks in 1997. It wasn't only the floodwaters, but there was fires happening as well because of gas leaks and buildings on fire. And the waters continued to, to rise. On Monday morning, the pastor realized a grave mistake or something he just didn't see was a possibility. You see, the structures of buildings were starting to collapse. Buildings were starting on fire, and of course the floodwaters were rising. And he realized that the Eucharist was still in the tabernacle. Of course, where is the Eucharist? It's in the tabernacle. They didn't expect any flood water to come that high to destroy the upper part of the church. They weren't expecting fires. And so he said, I need to go back to move the Eucharist so it's not desecrated. He had to pull many strings. You can imagine, they're only doing rescue missions at this time. So we're not going back for anything but people. And I can only imagine the line he said was something like this. It's not a piece of bread. It's Jesus Christ truly present in the Eucharist. They had to pull a lot of strings, the parishioners told me back then. But eventually, the pastor and other priest were escorted in military vehicles back to the church, starting with trucks and then boats, and then I think the last part, a little rescue dinghy to get them to the church. When they arrived, like I said, the basement was completely flooded, but the sanctuary itself was still intact. They didn't go back to get money out of the safe. They didn't go back to get baptismal records. They didn't go back for anything but one reason only, and that was to get the Eucharist. So the priest came in, they removed the Blessed Sacrament from the church, which once again may have been the first time ever in the history of that parish that the Eucharist was not present in the church. And they removed the Eucharist and brought it to another church. The reason I'm so inspired by this story is it just shows the reality of the Eucharist, that it's not a piece of bread, it's not a cup of wine. It truly is Jesus Christ. And this pastor and this priest and the parishioners knew this. And they weren't going to give up until the Eucharist was retrieved and put in a place of honor and dignity and safety. Do we have that same faith? Do we have that same belief? Can we believe, as Jesus said today, in the gospel, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Do we believe that we're truly eating, gnawing on Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood when we come to receive him in the Eucharist? Oh, how we want to say yes. We want to believe. We know it in our mind. We say, I want to, I want to say yes. So often, doubt can creep in. We know that it's a hard teaching to believe. We even hear about this in John chapter 6 a little bit later. The teacher is saying it's hard to believe. Who can believe it? And half of his apostles leave. The Eucharist, the source and summit of our life. But doubt can creep in. And so today as we have this beautiful solemnity, of Corpus Christi. We realize that we are not only moved by our senses, but instead maybe moved by our faith 
and moved by our belief. And we can even say to God, God, Lord, Jesus, help my unbelief. And he's there. He is there to help us. So we may encounter him truly present, not in a piece of bread, not in a cup of wine, but in the body and blood of Christ. What beautiful witness we have of all of these different uh, stories of Eucharistic miracles, as witnesses of, of Eucharistic martyrs. We could go on and on about this, and I encourage you to, to read more about the Eucharistic miracles and, and martyrs as well. But I just want to draw your attention back to maybe an experience you had three years ago. When at this time, you're finally able to come back to Mass. How hard was it during that COVID shutdown when you could not come and receive the Eucharist? Do you remember the first time you were able to come back and receive Jesus Christ truly present in the Eucharist? Remember parishioners having tears in their eyes because for their whole life they've been receiving him and they're finally able to receive him again. You know, we can beat ourselves up saying, how come I can have faith like that every single time I come and receive the Lord? But what that shows to me instead is the great faith you already have. Can our faith go deeper? Of course it can. And God is there to help us. And so today on this beautiful feast, we just come before the Lord and say, Lord, continue to feed me. Continue to give me your grace and your strength. Help me to encounter you as you encounter me, even in my weakness, even in some of my unbelief. Know that I truly want to believe. And through you, with you, and in you, I can believe.